Hello, everyone. I'm Dee Simon, the Baral Family Executive Director of the Holocaust Center for Humanity. On this Yom HaShoah, as we come together virtually during an unprecedented health and economic crisis, we remember the Holocaust and are given an opportunity to reflect on its lessons of resilience. Many of the survivors I've met exemplified resilience. Although they were haunted by memories, they carved out lives with families and careers. Mel Wolf of Blessed Memory once told me that he didn't define himself by his job or his loss, but by his ability to rise from the ashes of Auschwitz and bear witness to help create a better future. The Holocaust teaches us that during times of heightened fear, there are those who turn to scapegoating, xenophobia, and hurtful rhetoric. But difficult times also bring out the very best in humanity. At the Holocaust Center, we have the privilege of seeing the very best every day. Volunteers and members of our student leadership board have been paired with Holocaust survivors, calling them regularly, easing their isolation, and making sure that our survivors have what they need. We see the best with the cadre of teachers and parents who are educating their students from home and using the center's resources because teaching their children to be good citizens matters, especially during hard times. We see the best with donors who are supporting Give Big to fund our book by book program, putting books in the hands of students throughout our state. And we see it in the hundreds of students who are expressing their feelings through writing, poetry, art, and films created at home and submitted for our annual contest. The center is not waiting for this pandemic to end. Please go to our website and see the many ways we're connecting to the people we serve. Intolerance doesn't rest during a crisis, and neither will we. As we honor the victims and survivors of the Holocaust, we also pay tribute to the rescuers and to the soldiers who risked their lives. However, on this remembrance, in order to build a brighter future, it may not be enough to mourn the losses of the past, on this Yom HaShoah, we may need to tap into our own resilience, remember the humanity that is in each of us and our responsibility to each other. We have a meaningful program planned for you this afternoon with survivor George Elbaum. George's wife, Mimi Jensen, friends at the Center for Years. Currently, they support both the student leadership and teacher advisory boards. George is a member of our Speakers Bureau. He speaks all throughout the country and in Poland. We're grateful for his passion and willingness to share his story with us today. But first, I'd like to introduce Rabbi Daniel Wiener, Senior Rabbi at Temple to Hirsch Sinai. Rabbi Wiener has been a strong and consistent partner of the Holocaust. We appreciate his ongoing support and his partner and his participation in our program today. Thank you so much, Dee. Thank you. It makes sense that out of the dramatic and extreme moments of our current crisis, people wonder not only how we are enduring the constraints and fear, pain, and struggle of this moment, but what will life be like once this plague has passed? What are the enduring lessons gleaned, the structures of our society changed, and the way history will view this time? Will it be remembered for its failures or its fortitude, for its struggles with self-interest, or its honoring of heroic sacrifice? And while there are, without qualification, significant distinctions between the challenges of this moment, even with its losses and the horror that was the Shoah, one cannot help seeking some analogies to an event with similarly deep and wide ramifications. Some have said there can be no analogy, metaphor, or even art after the Shoah. Yet it is our very human need to find insight in history, perhaps especially tragic history, that empowers us to find a glimmer of redemption from even the darkest days. The Shoah, and the corona crisis both exalt the true meaning of sacrifice. 
The Hebrew word for sacrifice emerging from the worship in the temple in Jerusalem is korban. Korban connotes a sense of drawing near. The implications are obvious and powerful. When we offer something of meaning and value to another or to others, it is because we have moved closer to them in empathy and the action that it demands. Even in the depths of the camps, there were miraculous acts of sacrifice as the risks of righteous Gentiles renewed our faith in humanity. And now, first responders, medical personnel, and those who garner and stand at points of purchase for our food are risking their lives and those of their families at home. When the history of this moment is written, their acts of courage and bravery will be indelibly inscribed in our hearts. The Shoah and the Corona crisis both demonstrate the urgency of hope, even in the midst of trials that crush the spirit. Many believe that the key to survival in those darkest of days was a capacity to see beyond a moment that obscures possibility. It is the imaginative power of faith that enables us to see beyond the here and now to the could be the should be, the will be, if we can just hold on a little longer, endure a little more, envision a life and world that is better and brighter. And while the barriers that confront us in this pandemic pale in comparison to the suffering inflicted by the radical evil of the Nazis, we still must push against the rhythms of our times when web pages need to load in nanoseconds and questions require answers instantaneously. For a virus knows no timetable or schedule, no stock market trend or quarterly report. We must ride this out patiently and proudly with an eye and heart toward the future, if not for our own sake, then for the sake of others, especially those most vulnerable others who desperately need our discipline, those for whom the Torah was constantly concerned. And finally, the Shoah and the Corona crisis inspire us toward common cause for common purpose. Nazism and the immensity of its destruction were defeated, not by the acts of one or two years or nations, but by the recognition that its crimes were not geopolitical nor strategic, but a toeva, an abomination against humanity. Only when the nations of the world, comprised of the good and the decent, rose up together to confront such evil, was the day won and the demonic vanquished. And we hope, we pray, that the solidarity and sense of being in this together that has marked so much of this epidemic might continue well after a vaccine comes to our rescue. We hope, we pray, that our awareness has been heightened, our will engaged, and our vision made boundless in meeting our growing inequities with greater justice, our growing need with greater gifts, and our growing cynicism with greater hope. A poet and freedom fighter, Hannah Senesch, who so beautifully exemplified some of the existential transcendent experiences and values of what it is to be a human being, those words were set in song that continue to inspire us as they inspired her, even in her darkest, most heroic moments, seeking to rescue Jews from Hungary during the war. It is a cause and a purpose to which she dedicated and sacrificed her life. And I'd like to share those words. Eli, Eli, shelo yigamer leholam, aho vehaya, rishu shel hama. Shamayim Tfilat Adam Ha'cho V'hayam Rishru Shel Hamayim Berak Ha'shamayim 
תפילת האדם. O Lord my God, I pray that these things never end. The sand and the sea, the rush of the waters, the crash of the heavens, the prayer of the heart, the sand and the sea, the rush of the waters, the crash of the heavens, the prayer of the heart. We are so pleased to have with us today George Elbaum, who as a young boy was hidden with non-Jewish families in Warsaw, Poland. George is a member of the Holocaust Center Speakers Bureau and is dedicated to supporting Holocaust education. Thank you so much, George, for sharing your story with us on Holocaust Remembrance Day. Yeah, still is focused on him. What? Yeah, for whatever reason, it's not doing it. It's all good, George. You can start talking now. Everyone can see you. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm not on the screen yet, though. Yes, you are. Everyone can see you now. Okay, good. Thank you. Rabbi, thank you very much for the introduction and to the general audience. I'd like to tell you about the world that I was born into, the dangerous world that I survived, but only because of major luck, in a world that I hope none of you, no one, no, no one anywhere has to experience. The place, Warsaw, Poland, the time, September 1939, Hitler's Nazi armies invade Poland, and that starts World War II. Um, I'm not seeing my PowerPoint yet. Okay, good. Um, yeah, let me just do this. Yep. Okay, there we go. Okay, uh, Hitler's Nazi armies invade Poland and that starts World War II. With hundreds of airplanes, thousands of tanks, a million troops, the, the Nazi army, there we go. The Nazi army invades Poland and then it starts World War II. With hundreds of airplanes, thousands of tanks, a million troops, the Nazi army sweeps across Poland and conquers it in one month. Then they hold a victory parade on the streets of Warsaw. And even Hitler himself comes to view it. Now, I was born in Warsaw. I lived there at that time, but I do not remember this because I was only one year old. But I remember most things since I was three. And at that time when Hitler invaded Poland, I had a family of, of a dozen people, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles. Uh, within three years out of the dozen people, only my mother and I were still alive. The other 10 were all dead, murdered by the Nazis. Why? Because they were Jewish. As I'm sure you know, the goals of the, party, of the Nazi party was to, um, to, uh, 
to kill everyone who they considered undesirable. Jews were on top of the list, but there were others, gypsies, gays, invalids, socialists, handicapped people, but Jews were on top of the list and they were the largest group. And at that time when Hitler invaded Poland, it was about three and a half million Jews living in the country. By the end of the war, five years later, 90% of them, nine out of every 10 were dead, murdered by the Nazis. What became known as the Holocaust was the murder of six million Jews during the five years of the war. Now, six million is a huge number. I don't think it's a human number. I cannot feel it, and I doubt if many of you can either. So I'm gonna to try to put it into more human terms. Let's consider for the moment averages. Six million Jews murdered in five years that averages to a million two hundred thousand every year or a hundred thousand every month. That's still a huge number. But let's consider something human, a city, Seattle. Population of Seattle is about 600,000, roughly. So that means that the rate that the Nazis were killing Jews averaged 100,000 every month. That's essentially saying that, that they, they, could, they would kill every man, woman, and child in Seattle every six months. Or the six million Jews is equivalent to 10 cities the size of Seattle. I hope that gives you a feeling for the immensity of the Holocaust. 10 cities the size of Seattle. Now, first question, of course, is why did the Nazis do it? The answer is anti Semitism, hatred of Jews. But anti Semitism, just like all the other antis, whether it's anti Christian, anti Muslim, anti Black, anti White, anti Gay, anti Straight, it's hatred for someone, not because they've ever done anything to you, but because they're different maybe different color skin, maybe different way of worshiping God. And all the antis, all the antis are nothing but negative. They always, always lead to destruction. In this world, in this life, if you wanna do anything good in, in your life, you have to be for things, not against things. Those of you that are students, please remember that as you go through your life to maturity, be for things, not against things. Now, in addition to the cruelty and inhumanity of murder on what I call an industrial scale, you could also ask yourself, how is it possible to do that? How is it possible to kill everyone in Seattle every six months? Well, the Nazis were very efficient, at least when it came to the process of murder. And the way they started this murder process is by establishing what they became known as the ghettos. Uh, in each of the countries that they conquered, they chose one or two or three major cities where, where there was already a large Jewish population. And in that city, they established the ghetto. Now, I was born in Warsaw and I lived there. So I would just tell you about Warsaw ghetto. It was by far the biggest ghetto of all. So in Warsaw, the Nazis chose about 2% of the area of Warsaw whereas the Jewish population was about 30%. And then the Nazis built a wall around that small 2% area, which became known as the ghetto. A brick wall with barbed wire on top, with gates that were guarded by soldiers with machine guns and dogs. And once the wall was up, the Nazis swept the other 98% of Warsaw, collected all the Jews that lived in those 98%, which is probably about 80 or 90% lived outside the wall. And they collected all of those Jews and they forced them all into the ghetto. And then they swept the rest of the whole countryside around the whole area of Warsaw, the smaller towns and villages and smaller cities. They collected all the Jews from that whole region. And, and some of those, they also had Jewish populations of 20 and 30 and even 50%. I know because over the last five years, I've spoken in high schools in some of those cities that had up to 50% Jewish population, and now their Jewish population is zero. And they collected Jews from all of those, the whole region, and they forced everyone into the ghetto. So think about it. Think about if you have an, an area, of, let's say in Seattle, 100,000 people live in it. And you, if you build a brick wall around it, so there is another uh, 500,000 living outside. What if you, force those 500,000 into that small walled in area where there's only 100,000 people already living there. If you were being forced in, where would you go? Well, if you were lucky, if you had friends or relatives living within this walled in ghetto, 
you would move in with them. And I remember when I was about three years old, suddenly there was like a dozen strangers that moved into the apartment where at that time only my mother, my grandmother and I were there. The men, like my uncle, my grandfather, they've already been taken away by the Nazis. And by that time they were all dead, but we didn't know about it until after the war. So these strangers, they were sleeping on the couches, on the floor, on the kitchen, in the hallway. And I remember asking my mother, who are these people? What are they doing here? And my mom said, well, they're friends. They've been with us for a little while, whatever that might mean to a three-year-old. But once the Nazis were satisfied, they collected Jews from the whole Warsaw region. And, and uh, uh, they would start taking people, and they forced them all into the ghetto. They started taking people out of the, out of the ghetto putting them on trains and sending them to concentration camps and most of them to the gas chambers. So rather than telling you about it, I'll read to you a chapter from my book that I wrote nine, 10 years ago. The book is called Neither Yesterdays Nor Tomorrows. And if if we have time, I'll tell you that my writing it was inspired by a small middle school in a small town in Tennessee. I've never been there, never met anybody from there, but they inspired me to write this book after I was silent about my Holocaust childhood. For 65 years. The chapter I'm going to read to you is called Umschlagplatz, which in German means shipping point or collection point. Now, I do not speak German. I never did. And the first time I heard the word Umschlagplatz was when I was four years old. I'm 81 now, so that was 77 years ago. I've never forgotten that word, Umschlagplatz. Suddenly there was loud, no, uh, loud shouting coming from the courtyard. Then the entire apartment complex was filled with ear-splitting noise. Shouts, screams, doors banging everywhere, and heavy running footsteps. My grandmother ran into the room holding my coat, grabbed my hand, and led me to the staircase, which was already filled with people, all going downstairs. When we reached the courtyard, it was already full of people, crowded together in groups, with soldiers in dark, dark green uniforms, shouting orders and walking between the groups. My grandmother held my hand tightly as we were pushed back and forth by the crowd till finally we were standing at the edge of our group, facing a large arched entry gate that led from the street into our courtyard. It seemed that we stood there a long, long time. I remember being glad that my grandmother put my coat on because I was getting cold. I remember being, seeing some groups being led by soldiers out of the courtyard through the big gate, exactly what you see there on the screen. Soldiers are guarding these people, civilians, men, women, and children who are being led out through the gate. Then suddenly I saw my mother running in through the gate, holding a piece of paper in her hand, showing the paper to some soldiers, talking with them, and finally coming to us, to my grandmother and me, and leading us out of the courtyard. It was only years later, after the war, that I understand what just happened. The Nazis were emptying out the Warsaw Ghetto, apartment block at a time, and shipping the residents to concentration camps. My, grand- my mother, who at that time was working in the ghetto in a factory which the Nazis authorized the, the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee to manage and make uniforms for the Nazi army, my mother somehow learned that our apartment block was being emptied out that day. She got from the factory director an official document allowing her to keep her family in place. With this document, in effect, a temporary permit to continue living. Think about it for a moment. That little piece of paper was a temporary permit for my grandmother and me to continue living. With this document, my mom managed to convince the Nazi officer commanding that day sweep to let us go. Had she arrived a few minutes later, it would have been too late. Because if my mom had arrived a few minutes later, my favorite would have been like that little boy that you see there on the screen because he lived maybe another week or two longer after this photo was taken. Because from here, these people were taken directly to freight yards, put onto freight cars, cattle cars. Um, I'm trying to move the slide. Uh, Here, they were taken to, to the freight yards, as you see here, and shipped directly to concentration camps. And all children, most women, and all the older or weaker men would be almost immediately sent to the gas chambers. So if my mom had arrived a few minutes later, I wouldn't be here with you today. I would have been dead long ago. Pure, pure luck. Um, I mentioned that people were lucky because they had friends or relatives living in a ghetto. 
what if they didn't know anybody. They would have to live on the street. And Poland, Warsaw is a the northern city, like Boston, Seattle, New York, Toronto. During the winter, it gets very cold. Because of that, during the two and a half years of the ghetto's existence, 80,000 people died within the walls of the ghetto. They died from disease, they died from starvation, they died from exposure to the elements during the winter. And I remember particularly in the winters, in the winter mornings, I would occasionally hear a sound kind of like clang, clang, clang. It was the sound of a wooden wagon that was being pulled over the cobblestone streets of the ghetto. They would collect bodies of people who had died in the ghetto during the night and taking those bodies out. The ghetto was not a good place to live, was not a good place to die. Uh, the, the slide doesn't move on me. Here you see a couple of kids freezing, begging for food, sitting on the street. Uh, there was no food to be given. We were all starving. What happened next? My mom was a very smart woman. She realized sooner than most people within the ghetto that the days of the ghetto and everybody in it were numbered. She decided to try to get us to safety when there was still a chance. And the next place uh, flight to safety is a place I call the shed. Uh, and the reason that I put the shed on the cover of my book is that I still remember that scene. I was four years old. I remember that scene and had a major effect on my adult life, on my professional life. So I'm going to read to you a short chapter called The Shed. We can, only we can only speak in whispers here, my grandmother told me. We were now in a large shed with corrugated metal walls and ceiling, pieces of rusting metal equipment strewn about, and our bags and blankets on the floor. Several families were here with us, that no one that, but no one that I recognized, all with bags and suitcases and blankets. One family even had a little black dachshund that its owners told us that it never barks. I petted his soft fur and I played with him. Some of the people played cards, some knitted, but no one spoke except in very quiet whispers. My grandmother took some bread and sausage from her bag, made tea on a little chemical burner, and that was our dinner. When it got dark, no one lit any candles. We wrapped ourselves in our blankets and we slept. I woke up in the morning and I wanted to play with the little black dachshund, but it was gone. So I asked, I asked its owners, where is it? And their only answer to me was, it's gone. Years later, my mom told me that during the night, its owners had to choke it to death to keep it from barking at footsteps outside the shed. If any of you have a small pet, can you imagine choking it in your lap to death? I cannot. That day, or perhaps many days, went by very slowly in the near silence, the only sounds coming from outside the shed. There was a big hole in the shed's roof through which I watched white clouds on blue sky. Once I saw an airplane with black crosses on its wings flying across the sky, exactly what you see there on your screen, exactly that. That's the scene I remember. At that time, I didn't know there was a Nazi airplane and the black crosses were Nazi insignia. It just looked so beautiful to me against the blue sky. It wasn't constrained in a dark shed as I was. And I felt strangely drawn to it. I wanted to be in it. I wanted to be somehow with it. I never lost that feeling and interest in airplanes. A few years later, after the war, I would read Polish aviation magazines. And then later on in America, we moved when we moved here and I went to high school in Oregon, I would build and fly model airplanes. In college, I majored in aeronautical engineering. Then I worked in the aerospace industry. I took flying lessons, got a private pilot's license, crashed an airplane and walked away from it without a scratch. Again, pure luck. And then for 20 some years, I flew hang gliders in Southern California. Crashed about half a dozen times, walked away from all but the last one. And on that one, I crashed at the top of the mountains in Southern California. I woke up six hours later in Los Angeles. I was unconscious for six hours. And for my next birthday, my wife Mimi gave me as a present a video showing a rescue helicopter. It was taken from a newsreel helicopter showing a rescue helicopter lifting me unconscious from the top of the hill. And for my next birthday, and, and Mimi suggests that I watch it every time I get cocky. I don't think it does much good, but she still tries. 
Uh, anyway, I have never forgotten that airplane against the blue sky and the whole, through the hole in the roof and the feeling of awe and exhilaration that it gave me. That is why it's on the cover of my book. What happened next? My mom was a very smart woman and she realized sooner than most people that the days of the ghetto were numbered. So she decided to move us, to try to get us out of the ghetto. And we, from, the, from the shed, my mom put my grandmother into what she thought was a safe hiding place. It turns out it wasn't, but we only learned that after the war. So once we were out of the ghetto, my mom, um, um, uh, she, she put me, uh, when she was out of, out of the ghetto, the first thing she did is she dyed her black hair blonde so she wouldn't look quite so Jewish. And then she bought the identification papers of a young Polish Catholic woman who had died. She took on that woman's name. And the next time that my mom saw me, which I didn't live with her once we were out of the ghetto, my mom told me that my name is no longer Elbaum because Elbaum was a Jewish name. She told me from now on, my name is Shlivoski because that's the name on her papers. And every time that my, mother, my mom would buy a new set of fake ID papers, she would tell me what my new name was. Um, now, um, what happened in the, in the in meanwhile in the ghetto when we moved when we escaped from it? Enough information, including some eyewitnesses, managed to smuggle themselves back into the ghetto, so that everyone knew that the people who were being shipped out were going to concentration camps, and most were dying in the gas chambers. So a group of young civilians, twenties, thirties. Uh, 40s, they just, they knew that by that time they could no longer escape, so they knew they would all die. And they staged what became known as the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Now imagine a group of young civilians, no military training, they had some rifles and some pistols hidden in the ghetto, and they rose up against a trained Nazi army of thousands of soldiers with tanks and artillery and airplanes. The ghetto fighters knew they had no chance. They knew it was a hopeless, hopeless act of defiance. And they fought for about two or three weeks, and they all died. And here's a scene um, from the ghetto right after the uprising ended. Every man, woman, and child within the ghetto was, was dead, killed by the Nazis. And apparently Hitler felt personally insulted that the Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto dared to rise up against him. He ordered his army to destroy every building within the walls of the ghetto. And here's a panoramic shot of the ghetto right after the uprising. Every building within the walls was total, total ruins. The building that you see in the dark area within the back, the black line, those are the buildings of Warsaw right outside the ghetto's walls. Um, now, at that time, my mom and I were already outside the ghetto. And... Here is a photograph of my mom. It's the only photograph when she, she was seven years old that she managed to, to, to save because she kept it on her body, her, her photo together with her brother. Um, once we were out of the ghetto, as I said, she dyed her hair blonde, she bought the identification papers and she told me what my new name was. So with fake papers, with blonde hair, my mom went to work. First, she had some good jobs. She became an English governess or French governess to wealthy Poles who wanted their families to learn those languages. When those jobs ended, my mom took whatever was available that included becoming a cook, a maid, a scrubwoman, a laundress, whatever. As long as the job came with two benefits. Benefit number one, a room and board in the apartment of the people who hired her. And the reason that was critical is that she wouldn't have to walk to work on the street every day because every time that she was out on the street, she could be picked up by Nazi patrol or police and sent to concentration camp, fake papers or not. Less, uh, requirement number two, a little bit of cash to pay to the people who are keeping me. Because my mom realized that I would be safe where I was kept by a Polish Catholic family together with, her, with their kids. My mom tells me that throughout the war, so when I was four and five and six years old, my hair was light brown and I didn't look Jewish. It was only after the war that my hair within a year or two turned from light brown, dark brown, and black. 
And then a couple of years ago, miraculously, it turned up light again. Um, when I speak in high schools, I tell the kids to ask the grandparents if they don't know how that happens. Um, so my mom survived by luck, strength, and wits. I survived by luck only. And I'll give you an example of my luck. One of the first families with whom I lived, I remember I was sitting at a table eating soup. It must have been evening time because um, I remember somebody was lighting a kerosene lamp on the table. So I'm sitting there eating soup. And then all of a sudden there's this loud banging on the front door and loud shouts in German. And everybody rushed to the front door, but I didn't. I continued to sit there and eat soup, probably because I was hungry. I was hungry through most of the war years, but that's because there was not enough food in Poland and some of the people who kept me didn't feed me very well. So uh, I had a bowl of soup in front of me and I was eating it. And then I was ignoring all the commotion that was taking place behind me at the front door. Then all of a sudden I sensed that somebody was staring at me. I remember I turned to his side and I looked and there was a tall Nazi soldier standing there looking straight down at me. I remember he had on this heavy dark green coat, so it must have been winter time. And on his shoulder, he had this large weapon, like a rifle, but a big barrel, barrel with holes around it. Now I know it was machine gun, but at that time, even at the age of four, machinery fascinated me. So I just kept staring at his gun and staring at it. And finally, I looked at him and I smiled at him. I don't know why, and I don't, don't know why I, I still remember that, but I smiled at him. Then I continued to eat soup and ignored him. He stood there another moment or two, probably trying to decide what to do about me. And then he left and moved on, and soon he and the other soldiers were gone, and all was quiet. I learned after the war that had I shown any fear whatsoever, he would have made me drop my pants to see whether I was circumcised, because only Jews were circumcised in Poland that time. And if that had happened, I would have never reached my fifth birthday. So once again, pure, pure luck. Now, uh, I lived with about four or five different Polish families throughout the war. And every time that my mom, my mom would move me from one family to another, when the family with whom I was living alerted her to danger, to danger to me and danger to them. And the reason for that was that the Nazis decreed in Poland that any Polish family who kept, Jew, who were hiding Jews would be, sent directly to concentration camp together with the Jews that were hiding. So I'm gonna ask you a question. It's a challenge question, which I like you to think about, but answer it only to yourself. And I asked this question from all of, all of my audiences. Imagine that you're now working in a foreign country for an American company, uh, and you learn that the government of that country is starting to persecute a small minority. They're arresting them, throwing them in jails, beating them, killing them. And you know that they're innocent. They're just minority and the government is prejudiced. And you know that you could save one of them. Imagine you could save a little skinny undernourished four-year-old kid as I was. We took him or her into your house or apartment. But you might be risking maybe your life. Would you do it? Would you do it? Please answer that honestly, but only to yourself. But the four or five different Polish families that took me in, they took that risk. They saved me. And that is the only reason I'm with you guys here today, because they saved me. I'm very thankful for that. The very last family with whom I lived was headed by a man named Leon. His is the only name I remember, and only his first name. Probably because I liked him. He was fair to me all the time, every time. But he was also kind sometimes, but he was tough. And whenever I did something uh, that I was forbidden to do, such as eating food when I was alone in the apartment. He beat me, and he beat me hard. But I always knew why he was beating me. I knew that I deserved it, what I had done. And if it involved eating some food because I was really hungry, sometimes it would be even worth a beating. So I liked Leon. I didn't like his wife or their little daughter, maybe a year younger than I, because every time my mom would visit me, that might be once a month, every several months. Last time I didn't see her for six months. My mom would bring me a present. It might be a little wooden toy. Or it might be a hard boiled egg, which was a very nice present in wartime Poland when everybody was hungry. My mom always, always stayed around, made sure that I ate the egg when she was still there. She wanted to make sure I got it. But after, after my mom would leave, Leon's wife very often would take away the little toy 
and give it to their daughter to play. So I didn't like them. I was with Leon from beginning of 1944 through the end of that year, and that included August 44, time of the Warsaw Uprising. Now, Warsaw Uprising was different in one very funda fundamental way in that the ghetto fighters thought they had a chance to win. Uh, uh, I'm going to skip the details, but apparently the day or two right before the uprising started, which was the 1st of August of 1944, Leon must have gotten wind that, about the uprising. So the day before, he and his wife packed a bunch of suitcases and boxes. We loaded them the next day on morning, early morning on the pedal powder rickshaw. And with him, with Leon pedaling and his wife and daughter and I sitting on the luggage, we left the city. The Warsaw Uprising had just started. Uh, as we were driving, riding out of the city into the countryside, eventually Leon stopped to rest along the side of the road. And I asked him, where are we going? And he said, to my cousin's farm. I wandered away along a ditch that runs besides the road. And then suddenly I noticed this dark blodger, like a large potato lying in the grass. I picked it up and felt cold and heavy like metal and had a shiny ring on one end of it. I started to play with it and I pulled on the ring and it came out in my hand just as Leon called that we're leaving. So I tossed the object over my shoulder and it fell into the ditch and I ran to the rickshaw. As I had jumped onto it, there was a big, big explosion from where I had just been and Leon started pedaling furiously, much faster than before. It was only later that I realized that the dark blue object was a German hand grenade. And whereas Leon didn't know what I had done, he did know that any poles found by the Nazis any weapons or explosives would have been shot on the spot because of the uprising that was just taking place in Warsaw. So double luck. If Leon had called me a few seconds later, the grenade would have exploded in my hand. And if there had been any Nazi soldiers in the vicinity, they would have tried to find us after hearing the explosion. And if they found us, they would have shot every one of us. Um, I lived with Leon and his family on that farm through the end of the year. I remember going Christmas caroling with him that Christmas. And in January, early January, suddenly my mother appeared. I had not seen her for six months. So I didn't know when I would see her or even whether I would ever see her again if I, not, if I allowed myself to think about it that way. So that was probably my, the happiest moment of my childhood when I saw my mom alive. But a week or two after that moment, um, my mom woke me up. I was sleeping and she woke me up and she had tears at her eyes. She said to me, you are saved. No, I didn't know what she was talking about. But she took my hand and pulled me out of bed and, and dragged me behind her and we were going to the main room in the farmhouse. And when we got there, there were soldiers there, but they didn't have the dark green uniforms of the Nazis, they had olive uniforms. My mom bent down to me, she said, they're Russian. Well, Russian didn't mean anything to me. I didn't know anything about Russia. Uh, but when the Russian officer saw me, I was the only little kid in the room. He reached into his pocket and took out a little white cube and he handed it to me like this. I didn't know what it was. So my mom said to me, take it, taste it, it's sugar. So I put it in my mouth and I swore it was the best taste I have ever, ever had in my whole life up till today. And ever since that moment, I have this tremendous sweet tooth. I can start dinner with dessert, have the dessert for the main course and end it with dessert. And I would do it sometimes, except my wife never lets me. I know she's right, but uh, I still would love to do it sometimes. I call that moment the sugar cube miracle. Uh, about a week or two after the sugar cube miracle, we learned that the, uh, that the Russians had pushed the Nazi army out of Warsaw. So my mom and I returned to Warsaw, mostly by walking or some occasion getting rides on military trucks. Can you move the slide for me, please? Warsaw looked like this, except there was a lot of snow. And uh, occasionally, some in pl different places, half buried in the snow, I could see a body or two left over from the battle between the Nazis and the Russians. Uh, my mom very quickly got a job because she had been an attorney before the war. She got a job with a brand new book publishing organization that the that the Polish communist government established to print books and propaganda. And her job was to go around the country and set up bookstores because most of the bookstores were closed uh, during, um, during the war. Uh, in order to go to the, some of these 
places. My mom was given a car and a driver. Um, next slide, please. Um, uh, this is the second car. The first car died, so this is the second car she was given. And um, her driver was given a machine gun. And my, my mom was given a pistol. And the reason for that was that whereas in the Warsaw region, the Nazis had wiped out all, all of the pro-Western underground that started the uprising. In some of the farther out cities where my mom and her driver needed to go to set up a bookstore, there still were pockets of pro-Western underground that were resisting the communist takeover. They knew that only the government owned cars, so they would attack cars on the road. Luckily, my mom and her driver never needed to use their, wep their weapons. Again, luck. Uh, that was a very happy time for me because I thought that my mom would never again park me with some strangers or have me live somewhere else, but that's not what happened. Because two years after the war ended, next slide, please. Two years after the war ended, uh, I was on a train. This is my passport photo when I was eight years old. I was, my mom put me on a train with a group of other orphans, Jewish orphans or half orphans. We were, we were going by train to France and from France we would board ship and sail to Palestine. The reason for that, I found that out later. I didn't know at the time. My mom was sending me away. It was kind of like, a, uh, like the kinder transport that took place before the war. Jewish kids were being sent out to Palestine because of the, the pogroms uh, in, in Poland. And several, uh, several hundred Jews were killed by anti-Semitic Poles during those two years, 1945 and 1946. I would probably be living in Israel at Hemden for an accident. When I was in France with that group of kids, one night we were roughhousing, my trip fell, and I had a tremendous pain in my leg. And when they were inspecting my leg, they said that it was broken, they would have to take me to the hospital. And I would probably be living, and, um, and they did take me to the hospital, they put a big cast on my leg. Uh, but the rest of the camp went off to Palestine. They wouldn't take me because with a big cast on my leg, they had to run the blockade the British blockade of Palestine, a kid with a cast would be casualty. So they sent me back to Warsaw to my mom. The rest of the camp went off to Palestine. But two years later, early 1949, I'm back in France, and this time with my mom. Next slide, please. Uh, how did that happen? My mom did such a good job. This is my mom and me in Paris. This was summer of 1949. I turned 11 here. My, dad, my mom did such a good job setting up bookstores throughout Poland that the Polish communist government sent her to France to set up Polish bookstores in France for the Polish emigre community to try to entice them to come back to Poland. And my mom set up a number of Polish bookstores in France. And some, some years ago, my wife Mimi and I stumbled onto one of them actually. Um, but eventually my mom defected and that summer she went to the American embassy, applied for a visa for herself and for me. Her visa came through very quickly. And, uh, and my mom came to America that summer, that was September of 1949. My visa didn't. So my, my mom once again had to find some strangers and she parked me with this Polish French couple. And during the days I would wander all around Paris, ride the metro everywhere, picked up enough French so that whenever I got lost, I could ask somebody in French, how do I get home? And they would tell me in French and I always got home. But eventually my visa came through on the 1st of December, 1949. This Polish French couple put me on an airplane in Paris. My mom met me in New York. And uh, about a week or two later, uh, we took a train down to North Carolina to a small town, Cove City, 1,000 population. You can imagine the difference between living in Warsaw or Paris to a town of a thousand population. And when the year turned, my mom right away put me into school. She put me to sixth grade because I had been in fifth grade previous year in Poland. Now, the only problem was I didn't speak a word of English. Nobody there spoke Polish. So for the first month or so, uh, you know, I made some very embarrassing mistakes because I didn't understand anything. If we have time, ask me about uh, trying to learn baseball. Well, that was probably the most embarrassing, but also the funniest. Uh, surprising things, I didn't pick up their accent. Everybody there spoke with a heavy Southern accent. I learned English from them, and I didn't pick it up. My only explanation to myself is that my Polish accent was so heavy 
that kind of kept the southern accent away. From here, we moved to uh, in, in a year and a half. Um, so that was summer of 1951. We moved to a small town in Oregon, Forest Grove, about 30 miles from Portland. About a thousand, uh, Forest Grove is about 5,000 population. And that summer, when we got there, my mom right away took me to the uh, principal of the high school. And uh, he gave me an oral test to make sure that I, that I understand English and speak English well enough, and also that my knowledge was sufficient. And he allowed me, apparently I passed, because he allowed me to skip eighth grade and start as a freshman. Now, freshman year was tough on me. First of all, I was only a year and a half in America, so I still didn't understand or feel American culture. And I kept making social mistakes. They weren't as bad as North Carolina, but they were bad. Uh, and I was embarrassed. I was 13 by then, and 13 is a very embarrassable age. So I was embarrassed quite often. Number two, I was... I had a heavy Polish accent, and I was the only kid in school with an accent. That was embarrassing. And number three, I started stuttering badly, very badly. And it's probably because the memories of the Holocaust started to register in my head. Four years later, I graduated high school. Uh, during, uh, during school, I did everything the kids do. Um, the, uh, the summers, I would work in the fields like they do would pick strawberries and pick beans. Never made, made much pocket money picking strawberries because I loved them too much. I was eating too many of them. I did okay picking beans and the last couple of years, summers, I would work on a sawmill. I was already bigger and stronger so I could work on a sawmill. So I earned pocket money. Um, in my senior year, I went to my math teacher because I liked him. And I asked him, what is a good, would good school for aeronautical engineering? Because ever since then, I wanted something to do with airplanes. And he said, well, the best is MIT. I was very naive. I've never heard of MIT. Naive, by the way, is a nice way of saying stupid, but I've never heard of MIT. I didn't know that it was very difficult to get into. That was the only school I applied to. But I was also lucky, and I got in. And altogether, I spent eight and a half years at MIT in three separate phases. Um, by the end, I had four degrees from MIT, two in aeronautical engineering and two in nuclear and uh, including a PhD. And uh, in, the, in the phases between MIT and then after MIT, I worked in the aerospace industry. I was lucky to, enough to, to get a, a job with a, with a group that designed the, the rocket engine which lowered the, our Apollo astronauts to the surface to the moon, the surface of the moon. It was a great team and a great, a great project. Uh, after the aerospace in, uh, experience, I started commuting between California and Moscow, representing American companies in Russia. I, I did that for about 25 years. And throughout all those roughly 50 years, um, I kept, through all those 50 years, I kept uh, an emotional distance from the Holocaust because, uh, because I, I, I remember what it did to my mom. My mom was a very successful businesswoman in America. She was haunted by the Holocaust for a dying day. And I didn't want that to happen to me. So I never talked about the Holocaust. Very few people knew about it. And I kept that up um, until about eight, nine years ago, nine years ago, uh, Mimi rented a movie called Paperclips. And, and, and it had to do with the Holocaust, but it didn't show any Holocaust scenes. And when the movie ended, I realized that my story has value. So when, when it ended, Mimi asked me whether I would reconsider and write my book. Surprised her, surprised myself. I said I would do it. I, um, I finished it. I started the next day, finished it three months later. So it was probably about uh, March of 2010. And I thought I was finished. Well, not quite, because my best friend from Boston knew I was writing the book, and he told us, to the head of MIT Hillel in Boston, uh, Rabbi uh, Michelle Fisher, and she invited me to come to Boston to speak at the Holocaust Remembrance Memorial at an event she was staging there for Holocaust Remembrance Day 10 years ago. Uh, my first reaction was hell no, because I was afraid. I was afraid to expose my feelings to a group of, in public. But I thought, I'm being a coward. I already had tickets to fly to Boston then because I'm on a number of MIT committees. So 
I, I worked on it. I worked on it. I thought I had it down pat. Well, I thought I did. The man be, I was the final speaker, but the man before me s spoke about something that happened at, uh, during the uprising, which in the ghetto uprising, which I wasn't aware of, and I choked on it. And I kept choking when Michelle said, okay, it's your turn, George. And I kept choking throughout my talk. But enough people came up to me and said to me, you got to keep doing this. So I've been doing it ever since. This is my talk number 260. And it's the 10th anniversary of my very first talk. And 90% of my talks are to high schoolers because I learned from the Holocaust Center that uh, my audience should be old enough to understand and yet young enough to have an open mind. Adults, their minds are closed. I had a, uh, I've known even some good acquaintances with whom I used to hang glide who were Holocaust deniers. And when they learned about my pack, my background, they tried to convince me the Holocaust never happened. So there's no point. So uh, I speak mostly to high schools, occasionally to adults, uh, and so occasionally to, uh, to colleges. And as an example, right after the, the Pittsburgh synagogue massacre, uh, the UC Berkeley uh, uh, Business School invited me to come in. It was the Haas Business School invited me to come in and speak to their leadership course. And I, I spoke to them, about 60, 80 students. And afterwards, they asked me pretty much the same question several times over. What can we do to fight intolerance and, and anti-Semitism? And I told them, the first thing that you have to do is speak up. It takes courage. It takes courage to, to do that. But speak up. Say to whoever is saying something or showing something, even if it's a joke. Hey, would you speak up? I want to hear it. I want my friends to hear it too. you got to speak up because prejudice hides in the darkness. It, it fades in the light of day. Please try to remember that. And number two, support leaders, whether, whether social leaders, cultural leaders, or political leaders who also openly are fighting anti-Semitism and prejudice rather than leaders like our president who after the anti-Semitic march in Charlottesville said, they're fine leaders on both sides. No, they're not fine leaders on both sides. All the fine leaders and all the fine people are on the side of, of tolerance, not intolerance. So please, please, whenever you hear or see intolerance, speak up, please speak up, and please support leaders who also do that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, George, for sharing your story with us. This is Alana from the Holocaust Center, and we have a number of questions for you, George. So maybe we can just pick out a couple um, for you to answer if you're willing. Good, please. All right, great. So the first one is, were you ever angry with your mother for not staying with you? Um, you know, I've been asked that before. It's my time to think about it. And the answer is probably yes. But the one thing that I perhaps picked, picked up during the Holocaust, or maybe it was innate in me, uh, I forget bad things. I really forget bad things, even to this day. And that's why I, I called my book Neither Yesterday's Nor Tomorrow's, because things from the past that were bad, I forget. And some of the families didn't treat me very well, so I blocked out the bad feelings from the past, and probably being angry at my mom was one of them. By the way, that's why it's neither yesterday's because I forget the past, but I also do not look to the future uh, because I, during the war, I never knew when or whether I would ever see my mom again. That's why neither yesterday's nor tomorrow's. And to this day, I don't look ahead. I know it's much better in business, business to look ahead, to plan ahead. Uh, I don't do that. I've done well enough, but I do not look ahead and drives me, me crazy sometimes. But uh, it's the habit I picked up, and that's why I don't remember being mad at her. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, George. So here's um, another question. It is, how did you and your mother escape the Warsaw Ghetto? And you touched on it a little bit, but can you talk a little more about it? Well, the only thing that I remember about it is after, afterwards when I asked her, she said that, that uh, someone with a large backpack s smuggled me out in the backpack. and. The, this is what she told me. How she got out, I don't know. 
There are a lot of questions that occurred to me only when I was writing my book, which was 10 years ago. My mom died 15 years ago at the age of 91. So there is this whole slurry issue, a slew of questions that have, have arisen due to uh, my own writing the book or questions like you just asked me. I don't know. So let's do um, one last question, and I think this is a great one, uh, maybe for the last one. It says, what do you most hope young people of today can learn from your story and from the Holocaust? And does such learning become more relevant during this COVID-19 crisis? My advice to them, and I've been asked this, what takeaway would I want them to take away from my, my talks? And I'll give you the same takeaway. There's three points. Number one, keep an open mind. Number two, follow the golden rule. And number three, don't let anyone discourage you from something that you really want to do with your life and are willing to work hard for it. This is whether it has to do with the current crisis or it has to do with just life in general. But I think those are the three things that kept me going. And I've seen people becoming discouraged and I had someone to try to discourage me from even going to college. But uh, as long as one is willing to work hard for it, I, I strongly advise them. And they included some penitentiary type schools. So I tell them, don't let anybody discourage you. Keep an open mind and practice the golden rule. I do that. Thank you so much, George. Dee, I'm gonna turn the program back to you. George. Thank you so much. It's such a moving story. Thank you. We'll close our program today by lighting a virtual candle. I invite you to go to our website or click on the link in the chat box to light a candle and take a moment of silence in memory of one person who was killed in the Holocaust. As we remember the six million and the millions of other victims, we remember that unto each person there was a name. Moritz Kupfer is the name that we acknowledge today. And I, again, I invite you to please click on the chat or on our website and remember one person. We wish you a safe and reflective Holocaust Remembrance Day. And that concludes our program. Thank you for joining us.